posture. Uh, that's fine. Hi, I'm Keith McCullough, and welcome to another Real Conversation. It's with one of my favorite, not only authors, but thought leaders. Somebody who comes up with stuff before other people do that is actually timely topical, and over time becomes quite accurate. There are very few things, uh, Jim, that are as, or were as timely topical as this book, Currency Wars. Uh, 2011, yep. uh, I'm 100% certain that that's when you wrote it, because this morning's early look, I think, guys, you can pop that up there. I write this every day, my rant, you know, my daily rant, so I, you're part of my rant today, Jim. So right. you know, I just started with just the very basic and the most eloquent thing that you, you, know, you, you usually do this, but none of this happens in a vacuum, right. and I use that quote. And I also brought it back to the 19, you, you, you started by framing this 1970s to 1970, right. uh, and just saying, look, we do this. We taught the world to do this. Yep. And I often find that people just are, Probably in belief of that, but not enough of us talk about that as a matter of fact. Right. Do you think that that's because the Bernanks and, and everyone else doesn't want to take responsibility for it? Well, they, they don't, but I think it's bigger than that. I mean, I, I just am concerned that in general, uh, you know, attention spans are shorter. Uh, I've, yep. got, I've got three millennial kids. They're all really bright, really doing well in life. But um, I'm, so I'm kind of pretty well acquainted with the generation through their friends and so forth. They're, they're really smart. They can read. They don't like to read. They, uh, the rise of uh, podcasts, um, you know, uh, video casts, uh, and other medium, yep. and it's fine. I, I do the, I do them all. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I like to write and I like to read. And you're not, you're not a good, you can't be a good writer unless you're a voracious reader. Every, every writer has said so. So uh, yeah, I, I love writing books. And uh, you know, Currency Wars was the first book. One of the things I said in Currency Wars, so 2011. That's mm -hmm. right. It was, it was triggered by Guido Montanga, the Brazilian finance minister, who went to. A, uh, IMF meeting. He was a little bit rude. He said, "You know, we're in a currency war. The U.S. is leading a currency war." And everyone was like, "Please don't say that. You know, that's that's bad form." But it was true, and he was right. He's unfortunately he's been arrested in the meantime. Uh, but I don't know if it was that common or not. But so I started work, writing the book. Came out in the fall of 2011. But what I said was that currency wars don't happen all the time, but when they do, they can last for 15 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of historical examples of that. So I'm not at all surprised that here we are in 2019. And we're talking about currency wars. Now, the journalists always act like it's a new currency war. Like, no, it's the same currency right. war that started in 2010, but came out in 2011. Uh, they just don't end easily because there is no logical ending to it. What happens is, and this is happening, um, and I talk about this in the new book, currency wars don't work. They, they, they happen, and people try them, mm -hmm. and they think that, but they don't really work, and they morph into trade wars. Trade wars don't work either. Again, short-term effects, yep. it suppresses trade, et cetera. And then they morph into shooting wars. And that's what happened in the 20s, 30s, and up to 1939. So you had currency war in the 20s, early 30s, massive trade war in the 30s, and then World War II broke out at, at the end of the 1930s. So we're, we, we're 10 years into the currency war, nine mm -hmm. years into the currency war. The trade war started in earnest uh, about a year and a half ago when President Trump threw the, the tariffs on the solar panels and refrigerators, well, or washing machines, well, sorry, washing machines. Well, that, that, yeah, it sounds generic, but it was aimed at the Chinese and it's escalated from there to tariffs on $200 billion of the goods. It won't work. Uh, we'll win, kind of, but uh, Chinese will be, I'll put it this way, Chinese will be hurt more than we will, but it doesn't really solve any of the mm -hmm. problems. And then you have to worry, let's hope it doesn't turn into a shooting war. But that is the history, and that's, that's what I talked about in the book. Yeah, people just finally, the inequality gaps and wedges drive people to the final stage of frustration. I mean, that's, right. that's a big part of this. We're already there, I mean, obviously in the U.S. But if you think about the currency war, like, as just in the, and I know this is hard because we're taking the cyclical moment within the secular trend, which right. you're as good as anybody on, the, on that secular picture. But you have Trump and you have Powell and Trump, you know, aiding and abetting, you know, Powell to try to devalue. You got to devalue the currency. We got to get yeah. asset price reflation. That's right. But then you have the UK and what we call Quad Four growth and inflation slowing at the same time. Yeah. Europe will not recover. So you have Draghi fully committed, who's one of the greatest currency war players of all time. I might I totally add. agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you have all these Latin American currencies that are down in a ball of flames. So, like, how, like, how can they actually get it done? Like, can, can the Fed, if, what happens if the Fed is cutting rates and the dollar won't go down? Well, uh, yeah, or they're cutting rates and you can't get inflation, which is the other thing. <laughs> they're they're you know, yeah. two sides of the same coin, no pun yeah. intended. Um, 
Yeah, I, look, I just got back from uh, Bretton Woods. I was up there uh, earlier in the week. It was the 75th uh, commemorating the 75th anniversary of the original uh, Bretton Woods. Uh, we were at the Mount Washington Hotel, which I've been to before. I just love the hotel. That must have been cool. It was yeah. very cool. And you know, you walk around the halls, and like, it, yeah, it's been. It's got you know Wi-Fi and amenities and all that stuff. But it's built in 1902. It's the same hotel, wooden floors and columns and you're walking around like well this is where John Maynard Keynes walked you know <laughs> this is where uh, uh, Harry Dexter White the Soviet agent uh, walked uh, and he people was. that are there oh shit here comes Jim Rickards <laughs> <laughs> well yeah they, they might have been saying that but they, it was, what was interesting is that uh, it was it was a great group we had Larry Summers um, uh, former Secretary of the Treasury uh, economic advisor um, Stephanie Calton she's the chief economic advisor to Bernie Sanders 2020 so if he wins, you know, it might be a long shot, but if he wins, she's got some senior position. Ben Steele, brilliant scholar, brilliant writer, head of uh, one of the top scholars at the Council on Foreign Relations. So, you know, a couple doors down from Barbara Rubin, so he's pretty plugged in. It was, it was a great group, but at the same mm -hmm. time, there was a, a large crypto element, which is fine. You know, I'm not a big fan of Bitcoin, but I think blockchain will play some role in the future. Uh, so that was a younger group. They had yoga mats for everyone. I don't think uh, John Maynard Keynes had a yoga mat. Uh, you know, so you got. And then there was some shamanism and, and incense and all that. And I think the only uh, incense at, in 1944 was cigar smoke. Yeah. But so I was a little bit maybe more from the old school. But uh, you know, it was all very interesting. It was a, it was a great group. But uh, more more to the point, Keith. Um, there was one panel, technically off the record, so I can't give you the names or exact quotes, but uh, two very senior Fed officials and one very senior ECB official. So this was the real deal. And um, what surprised me, okay, the Fed's going to cut rates 25 basis point next week. Everybody, everybody knows that. It's, it's priced in, but it's pretty much of a lock. If there's a wild card next week, they may end QT, quantitative tightening, mm -hmm. two months early. Uh, supposed to end in September anyway. If they want to give the market a little double dose, they'll end it in uh, July. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. But this panel was was just, hey, rates are coming down in Europe and the United States. And it wasn't like, they didn't think it was like front page news. They didn't think it was, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, arcane. They're like, yeah, it's, it's, they've got to come down. Mm -hmm. And the U.S., uh, well, the Fed uh, people were talking pretty in a pretty relaxed manner about negative rates. Now, they, they, nobody said they're going to be negative rates or that's on the horizon, and we obviously have uh, you know, two and a quarter points to go. But uh, they, they didn't treat it like a taboo subject or something that wow. you couldn't even consider. Yeah. And they were making the distinction, and I rarely hear this because everyone's like, you know, rates are at an all-time low. I was like, well, nominal rates are, are close to lows, but mm -hmm. real rates are not. Um, I, I got my first mortgage in 1980, and it was 13%. And I told my mother, and she cried. I mean, her, her first mortgage mm -hmm. was like 4% or 3.5%. But I said, Mom, you know, it's like, yes, yeah, 13%, but inflation's 15%, and uh, it's tax deductible, and taxes at the time were 50%, so my real rate's only 65 so it's, it's negative, you know, negative 8%. Uh, They're paying me to borrow, and I tripled my money on the deal. But uh, yeah, so nominal rates have come down from, from you know, 13 yeah. or 14 to 2, got it. But real rates uh, have not come down. I mean, depending on your, there are 20 different inflation metrics, but mm -hmm. I, I just look at um, uh, PCE core year over year because that's what the Fed looks at, and that's 1.6%. 1, 1. Uh, and if you use, uh, I use 10 year note yield maturity because that to me is a good proxy for yep. business, business investment and mortgages. Uh, so that, uh, it's about um, 2.1 now. So yeah, it's, uh, it's half a point uh, positive. That's it. Real, which is uh, in my day it was you know three points negative, mm -hmm. so uh, so real rates are still high, and they, they kind of acknowledge that, and, and so they said we got to get real rates down. Well, particularly if they're sitting there with a, a senior official at the ECB, I mean, yeah, if they're trying to get along, they're at least going to entertain the very basic fact that they have negative interest rates as far as the eye can see, and that, and that that's what they think works. And he was he was relaxed about uh, going more negative. He was like, yeah, yeah that's going to happen. <laughs> so negative. so yeah, they're going to go more negative. Now here, here's the thing. Um, the idea of negative rates as a stimulus is, is just not true. It's a complete failure. An economic stimulus? Uh, an economic stimulus. It simply doesn't work. And the research is coming in, and, and here's, here's what it reveals. The market stimulus? Spies? Well, uh, the, the, the market's like a stock's like. No, it inflates asset values, but I'm talking yeah. about economic stimulus. real growth. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what happens is, so the theory is, um, you know, the, the lower, you get in the liquidity trap, you're going to lower interest rates and you're going to want to spend your money. But if I make them negative, you're really going to want to spend your money because you put 100000 in the bank at negative 1%, you come back a year later, 
there's uh, you know, 99,000 in the bank, and where'd your money go? So the idea is uh, it will cause people to spend money, lend and spend, get the mm -hmm. aggregate demand up, get the, you know, the lending and spending machine, uh, and gear again. That's not what happens. What people say is, you know, this is Modigliani, uh, people have lifetime goals, you know, your retirement, parents' health care, your health care, kids' education, whatever it is. If you're saving for that and I give you a negative rate, you actually save more. Yeah. So it, it adds to the liquidity trap. So why would you do it? Well, there, there are two reasons. One is currency wars, mm -hmm. uh, and the other one is just to prop up the banks, and certainly Europe needs that. So you know, the lower the rate, uh, you know, the lower the funding for the banks, they charge a little something, you leverage it 10 to 1, you get 20% returns on equity with very low risk. So, so there are reasons to do it, but economic stimulus is not one of them. Uh, but you know, the Fed was, again, they, they didn't predict negative rates. Uh, we still have a ways to go, but they were, yeah, that could happen. Well, they seem, it's, it's, it's an interesting shift, and it's, I guess, predictable to a great extent. I mean, even if you go back, and we have our Fed connections through Don Cohn, who you, you, you yeah. know, uh, yeah. you know, works for Hedgeye, former yeah. vice head of the Fed. But even at the Hoover Institute this year, which is maybe one of the last places that you would have seen it, I don't know if you were there, but there was, the talk of MMT was, was becoming fluid. Right. It used to be, are you kidding me? Yep. Now it's like, hmm. Maybe I could be the next famous central banker, central planner, whatever you want to call it, central market planner, right. to go there. And why wouldn't Trump and Elizabeth Warren want that? Well, Elizabeth Warren does. If, or, I mean, she hasn't spoken about it specifically, but certainly. Well, it's fine. The, the, the 2020 Democratic presidential candidates, you don't hear them say MMT. You hear that from Warren Mosler and Stephanie Kelton yeah. and, and uh, Paul McCauley is an advocate of, yeah. uh, of MMT. Well, presidential candidate can't really say, MMT doesn't mean anything to, to your normal Correct. person. But judge from their behavior and their policy. So uh, in the past, so what, what do we have? You know, Green New Deal, uh, free health care, um, child care for all, uh, free tuition, uh, student loan forgiveness, go down the list. And I don't want to debate the policies. I'm just, they're, it's all out there. They've said that. And it used to be you could shut down the debate in about two seconds. You say, well, it's interesting stuff, but we can't afford it. <laughs> and, they go, and then people go, yeah, you're right, we can't afford it. You know, we gotta die, die. But now you say, interesting, we can't afford it. And they say, yes, we can. Uh, and the reason is because of MMT. MMT posits that uh, you can uh, spend as much as you want. Uh, and I'm not exaggerating. I mean, I've actually, it's painful, but I've actually read their literature uh, because I have, I, too. It well, is I, have, I have a whole chapter in, in my book, Aftermath, about MMT. Is so, MMT in Aftermath? Oh, yeah. There's a whole oh, great. By the way, for those of you that don't know, this is, uh, this could be my second favorite book from records. We're going to have to see. I have to actually read it and dog ear it like I do everything else. But I mean, uh, Aftermath, this is uh, Jim Rickard's new book. And ostensibly, you're, going, you're basically going to say, how do you protect your assets? Right. If, if we're to go through MMT, so you go through that. Yeah. Well, I have a whole chapter on MMT. Uh, the chapter is called "Free Money." A little because there be money to be made in MMT. You just—it's not going to be the people that don't manage money. It's going to be you know the eighty or ninety percent of those poor bastards, which is the rest of America, is going to pay the bill. Right. It, it, look, if it becomes policy, it'll it'll affect markets. So there's money to be made or lost, depending on what side yep. of it you're on. Um, so the uh, so the chapter is called "Free Money." A little tribute to Patty Smith. And uh, so what MMT says? It, well, first of all. They integrate the balance sheets of the Treasury and the Fed like this. Mm -hmm. Now, we know they're separate institutions. One's executive branch, one's independent, et cetera. But they said, no, it's just one big happy family here at the, in Washington. So they integrate the balance sheets of the Treasury and the Fed. And they, they say, literally, spend as much as you want, uh, borrow the money. And if the bond markets get itchy, the Fed can buy it and uh, monetize the debt, put it on the balance sheet, wait 30 years, and get paid. What's the problem? And of all the things I've debated, like for years I've been dragged into these gold versus Bitcoin debates, which I think are ridiculous. I like gold, but, but the debate is kind of ridiculous. But this is one where uh, it took me a while to develop the critique. Because when you first hear it and you first understand it, you're like, well, what is the problem? And they say, here's the proof. Um, Japan's debt to GDP ratio is 250%. U.S. Yep. is 106%, highest since World War II. That's problematic for a lot of reasons we can get into. But they're like, hey, Japan's more than twice the size, so what's the problem? And by the way, if you want empirical evidence, we've got Ben Bernanke. Because what did Ben Bernanke do? He took the Fed balance sheet from $800 billion to almost $4.5 trillion, mm -hmm. all printed money. I understand it's M0, and uh, it's, it was put back in reserves. I, I get all that. But, but the fact is he printed uh, almost $4 trillion to do two things. One, bail out the banks and prop up Jamie Dimon's bonus. That was, I think it was the main objective. Uh, and then in theory, there was a wealth effect. Well, you got, the, you got the higher asset prices, but you never got the wealth effect. Mm -hmm. It just concentrated wealth, made, made the income inequality worse. But um, so 
So they said, Bernanke proved that you can print $4 trillion and nothing bad happens. There was no inflation, nothing significant. The world didn't come to an end. There was not another financial crisis. So the fact that he wanted to print $4 trillion to help Jamie Dimon, well, okay, we want to print $4 trillion to do the Green New Deal or forgive student loans or health care for all. And Bernanke proved you can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you get to the first item, the first data point, yeah, Japan is more than twice as high. Two, Bernanke did print $4 trillion, nothing bad happened. There's no legal impediment. I mean, the Fed can take their balance sheet whatever, wherever they want, and they can. There's no, and uh, I had a, I think I've related this before. I, I was at a, a small private dinner with one of the uh, board, members of the Board of Governors, and I said, um, yeah, after a glass of wine, I said, you know, you, you work for an insolvent institution on a mark-to-market -market basis. The, the Fed doesn't mark-to-market. They use historic costs, but I said, your, your, your institution's insolvent. Said, no, we're not. I said, uh, no one's done that math. I said, well, actually, I have, and I think others have as well. And she kind of harumphed and said, well, uh, maybe, but central banks don't need capital. Mm. That was an exact quote. Central banks don't need capital. Well, legally, they don't. It was a, it was a, that's true, true. a true statement. Mm -hmm. uh, query the impact on confidence down the road, but that's, that's a separate issue. So the point is, you actually could take the balance sheet to $10 trillion. Mm -hmm. You could finance a couple years' worth of Green New Deal. And uh, Bernanke did something like it for different reasons, and nothing bad happened. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's their argument. And then uh, you know, Stephanie Kelton's the big brain. She's a, a very nice lady, a professor at uh, Stony Brook uh, State University in New York out in Long Island. And she said, and by the way, if inflation emerge, we can deal with that. We know how to deal with inflation. Her, her, her way of dealing with inflation is to raise taxes. Um, so like, okay, we got, so you got an economic meltdown, inflation, and you want to raise taxes. That doesn't sound like a good formula. But, but their theory, in you know, modern monetary theory, there's nothing modern about it. This goes back over 100 years. Yep. Uh, it's not a theory. It's a, you know, it's just a wacky idea. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a theory in the scientific sense where you, you have falsifiable propositions that they don't. Um, it's modern, Jim. It's modern. It's modern. It's, it's modern. new. Yeah. Well, but, <laughs> it's, but, it's I, old. but you trace the origins uh, back to the early 20th century, and what you find are German monetarist scholars who created what they call the state theory of money. Whenever I hear the word state, you know, I, get, I get a little nervous. But uh, the state theory of money, and it says the following. Um, money will always be good if we say so, we the state, because we require it in taxes. So whether you like it or not, whether you have confidence, mm -hmm. in it, you have to earn it because that's the only thing we take for taxes. Don't give us gold, silver, land, or you know, rare wine. You got to pay the money. Therefore, you have to earn it. You have to like it whether you like it or not. And I, and I uh, debated uh, Marshall Auerbach, one of the other kind of scholars, and uh, I said, so let's just play that out, Marshall. So, uh, you know, I'm not, not advising this, by the way, but so you don't pay your taxes, what happens? Well, you get a nasty letter from the IRS, and you still don't pay, you get another letter, then you get a, a lien on your, your house, your bank account, and all that. And if you keep going, they show up at your house with guns and they arrest you and put you in jail. So I said, this is monetary confidence at the, at the point of the barrel of a gun, mm -hmm. uh, which sounds pretty neo-fascist to me. Uh, and, uh, the, and people get all upset when you, when you start talking like that. And I'm not name-calling it. Fascism means state power. That's, that's what Mussolini said that it meant. Um, so, uh, so they don't want to really talk about that. Uh, and so, so here's my rebuttal. So that's, that's the argument. Uh, and it is being uh, implicitly adopted by all the Democratic candidates because you can you cannot be coming out with these programs that will cost between five or ninety-five billion dollars, or sorry, trillion dollars for the Green New Deal. You cannot come out with these programs unless you think that we have a lot of headroom. We have a, we have a lot of fiscal headroom that mm -hmm. we can increase the deficit. We can double the deficit or the debt rather. We can take the debt to forty trillion dollars. 220% of GDP. GDP, that's their threshold. Without, uh, without problems. You, yep. you have to believe that to believe I, I don't believe that. Here, to me, here's, the, here's the, um, the critical point. First of all, yeah, you gotta pay your taxes, but you know, how much, so Mark Zuckerberg's worth like $100 billion, right? How much taxes he paid on the $100 billion? Almost none, he's paid some, but if you don't sell the stock, you don't owe the tax. So you, you, you know, your founder, you got founder shares, it goes to 100 billion. All right, you sell, you give it to foundations, you hold on to it, but you don't owe a nickel of tax unless you sell it. Mm -hmm. Same thing is true of gold, by the way. Uh, so, uh, so the wealthiest people don't pay taxes. Uh, they, they pay very little, just to be fair. Uh, poor people don't pay taxes because you, uh, you don't make enough money. Uh, we have a zero bracket amount and a uh, standard deduction. So who pays taxes? It's the middle class and the upper middle class working people. So the Democrats are kind of sticking it to them. Uh, saying you have to take the dollar no matter what. But it's not true. There are alternatives. Right? Maybe you, you're talking after tax dollars, or maybe you have some tax shelters, or you get uh, capital gains treatment, 
um, or deferral. Uh, there are one or more ways of minimizing and reducing your taxes, you know, including things like 401ks. But at the end of the day, you don't have to stay in the dollar. You can buy gold or silver. You can buy land. You can buy a natural resource place. There are a lot of things you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you just say, you know, get me out of here. I'm going to buy a new car because whatever. Uh, and then the car dealer, you know, takes a spouse out to dinner or whatever. You can increase velocity. Inflation can come out uh, out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And the idea that uh, Professor Kelton can deal with that by raising taxes, because mm -hmm. we're going to make it, you know, we're really going to make it like the dollar because you've got to pay more taxes. Well, especially will, will not work. especially in the current in the currency by which you're compensated. I mean, people. I don't know how this is a debatable point or even a point that people don't take as a given. But you know, the very basic statement that a central banker is trying to devalue your purchasing power by the currency right. and raise the prices by of, of the things that you're buying yeah. to me that is like it's the most basic reality it's also what's driven the inequality gap of course we're going to get the asset price inflation they're going to get the higher cost of living right. that's the trade right. um, and now mmt is effectively but i'm going to offset that by paying off your student loans like you say giving you a free you know, free education etc in my head like trump would love that Maybe not the same goodies, to, uh, but, but spend, 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 and print, print, print is the same thing for every Republican, every Democrat. Clinton is the last one where the rate of change of debt actually declined. Right. And that's because the actual real level of growth was so high. Right. But every, every party believes in this. Why wouldn't Trump go for well, a, just I, a different bag of goodies? Well, you're right, Keith, and I say this in the book. Don't, I don't rule out uh, Trump getting behind MMT. You don't? Uh, no, right. I don't. Okay, no, I, th I think, yeah, you're right. He's a real estate guy, loves leverage, uh, <laughs> uh, loves borrowing, uh, you know, what, yeah. what's not to like. Uh, no, I don't Instead of spending on green, you'll spend on the military. It's, it's just, you know, Correct. it doesn't... Maybe not in this election cycle, but no, down the road, or actually maybe maybe if uh, you never know what he's going to say at one of these debates or something, he might just come out and say, what's wrong with that? So, so this is the problem. It was a little bit like Bitcoin when it first came out. Everyone's like, hey, it's going up. What's the problem? It's like, well could go straight down, which it did. And, and I said that in, in December 2018, uh, sorry, December 2017, it was about 8,000. But it was going up $1,000 a week yeah. or, or more. And I said, look, uh, I'm not going to rule out this thing going to 20,000, but it's going to come straight down. And uh, that's exactly what happened. So the, the same thing with uh, the, the flaw in MMT is um, confidence. You know, you get in, you know, like, always start with money. What's money? You know, and I, I always say, hey, well, the Fed has, you know, M0, M1, M2. So even the Fed doesn't know what money is because they got three different definitions. But uh, and, you know, then anything can be money. Feathers, beads, digital, gold, silver, credit cards, debit cards, M0. They're all forms of money. And then people go, well, they're not backed by anything. You know, Bitcoin's not backed by anything or the dollar's not backed by anything. And I say, no, they're all backed by one thing. And it's the same thing, which is confidence. Mm -hmm. If you and I think something is money and I tender it to you for goods or services and you're confident that you can tender it to somebody else for goods and services, it's money. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what it is. But the problem is confidence is fragile. It's very easily lost and mm -hmm. impossible to gain or regain. So when you're messing around with money, you have to ask yourself, am I doing anything to damage confidence? Am I doing anything mm -hmm. which could very quickly lead to this not being money mm -hmm. uh, or uh, or being worth less because of inflation? Yeah, and the assets by which um, you own things. I mean, this is quintessentially what happened in, uh, in and throughout 08. Right. Like, you couldn't be more aggressive than Bernanke was. Right. And then he figured out that you know, the move is moving out or the, and high yield spreads are, are blowing out at the same time. Treasury bond vol goes up when bond yields are going down that fast. And he's like, we need more. I need, I need Hank. I need the bazooka. I need more, right. more, more. And, and as people realized that the more, more, more became the panic, yeah, then they started selling even gold. I mean, yeah. they sold everything. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just... Gold sold off and it came back, but it sold came back. I mean, yeah. so you're like, this, this is a very... That's why I'm... And I appreciate you're giving people a, you know, historic, a historical tutorial on this because that, to me, is the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's actually when people believe that the Fed can and will, by, you know, even through the aiding and abetting of whoever the president is, to, to devalue the dollar like Bernanke did. Right. It was a 40-year low. When currency wars came out, it was a 40-year low in the U.S. dollar index and an all-time high in, in gold. In gold, yeah, right. which is not surprising. I mean, no. the, the dollar price of gold is the inverse of the dollar. Yeah. Weak dollar, high dollar price for gold. But yeah. also real yields collapsing. I yes. mean, you were basically, yeah. um, you know, look at the move gold's had recently, and that's with the dollar strong. Right. You think that, I mean, people sit there saying, oh, a nice call on gold because we've made the pivot in October. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, I just, I just buy more of it when real yields are falling and I sell it when real yields are rising. Right. But 
Imagine a scenario where people fundamentally believe there's a bipartisan support for MMT. Yep. I mean, what probability is there? There's a high probability of that, is there not? If well, there's a 100%, close to 100% probability if a Democrat wins. Exactly. Uh, and then, and then I, Trump I wouldn't realize give a it's such a good idea. That, 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 that Trump could get on board. I mean, uh, look how quick he was to waive the debt ceiling. Yeah. Like today's GDP report, it's like, aha. Like, where did the Hedgeye predictive tracking algorithm get the 30 basis points wrong? Oh, government right. spending was up 35 basis points. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, trillion dollar deficits were last seen in the early Obama administration. So, 09, uh, 09, 2010, 2011, we had trillion dollar deficits. Then they, they got a little bit under control, all relative, down to 500 <laughs> billion or so. And everyone's like, yeah, problem solved. They're back. Uh, Trump's going to have two trillion dollar deficits back to back. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, my, the met metric I watch, is uh, debt to GDP. Uh, because, you know, I say, well, if you owe $25,000 on your MasterCard, is that a problem or not? Well, if you're making $20,000, you're probably heading for bankruptcy. Yep. But if you're making $300,000, you can probably pay it off with one check. So you cannot understand debt in isolation. You have to compare it to the capacity to pay, yep. and that's the GDP. Uh, but I have a whole chapter in my book, Aftermath. It's the uh, you know, the history of debt in the United States, the brief history of debt in the United States. Um, and the rate of change of that debt growth as, as relative to your GDP decline. Right. So people miss the point that when you devalue the currency and you get economic stagflation instead of economic, real economic GDP growth, right. what you end up is, you know, your, your, your denominator starts doing the wrong thing relative to what you're trying to do with the debt. Right. And it's like, ah, 1970s. Yep. And it, it, it's actually worse than that. You're exactly right, Keith, I agree, but it's actually uh, worse than that. So I, I trace it from George Washington to Donald Trump. Okay. Oh, good. Um, and, I'm sure uh, he would think that that's very, very appropriate. Well, when I was there, yeah, and put him in the same uh, category. When I was researching it, people, people kind of have a naive assumption. Like, George Washington comes in, no debt, and then it goes up and up and up and up and up, and here we are, it's Donald Trump, $23 trillion. That is not the story. When George Washington came in, we already had debt. We had a national debt before we had a nation. It was the Revolutionary War debt. And they turned to the Congress and said, what should we do? And the Congress said, well, we know what to do. Just default. Why would you pay it? And Alexander Hamilton stood up and said, no, let's borrow more money, yep. pay off the old debt, and then we'll borrow more money down the road and pay off the new debt. And as long as the economy is growing in a way that's supported, that was the creation of the government bond market. And it's been going strong for 230 years. Mm -hmm. um, but Hamilton presupposed growth. The other thing is it never went straight up. It went up and down and up exactly. and down. It's a sine wave. So then you explore that and say, well, what was the dynamic behind the sine wave? And this is one word answer, which is war. Mm -hmm. Debt went up in times of war, and it came down in times of peace. And then it was sort of dry powder for the next war, which do come along, and wars do come along, and then right. it went up again and down again. And I was struck by the bipartisan nature of it. And the, the, the most fascinating example was at the end of World War II, when FDR died, he, you know, he uh, didn't, obviously didn't uh, finish his term, but um, the debt, was, uh, debt to GDP ratio was about 120%, the highest in US history. Mm -hmm. Well, from the time Harry Truman came in until the time Ronald Reagan came in, 1980, uh, over that 35 year period, that debt to GDP ratio went from 120% to 30%, which is very manageable, well mm -hmm. within balance. But it was Democrats and Republicans, the yep. Fed and the Treasury, working together. It was, you had Truman, uh, Kennedy, Johnson, and Carter, but you had the Republican side, you had Eisenhower, Nixon, and Ford. And they all worked together on it. This was never a partisan issue. It was like, hey, we got to get this down. Now, Reagan comes in, and uh, this idea that he was a fiscal conservative is nonsense. He was the last <laughs> of the big spenders. He took the debt to GDP ratio up again to 50%. Yep. But to his credit, he won the Cold War. I mean, you know, 600 ship navy, Star Wars, and the Soviets just, the Soviet Union, Russia, they just threw in, threw in the towel. They said, we can't compete with this. So let's give Reagan credit for winning the Cold War. George H.W. Bush, Bush 41, and Clinton didn't get it down, but they kept a lid on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so for, for those 12 years of Bush and Clinton, they kept it around between 50 and 60%. And, and when Clinton left office, the national debt was $5 trillion. Okay, Bush 43 doubled it to $10 trillion. Obama doubled it again to $20 trillion. So 15, and then, and, and Trump's thrown on two more, uh, two more trillion. So 17 of the $22 trillion is in the last um, 13 years, 14 mm -hmm. years. Uh, so this idea that goes up and down and up and down is now off the rails. That mm -hmm. has changed. Okay, uh, you know, we had 9-11 and war in Afghanistan, war in Iraq was a war of choice. 
Obama didn't start any new wars. Trump hasn't started any new wars. So this was a time when, historically, Obama and Trump, in theory, would have worked to get the deficit back down. Didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Didn't happen. So now we are off the rails. Now it is out of control. Mm -hmm. We've broken with this precedent. I said we used to have bipartisan competence. Now we have bipartisan incompetence. Mm -hmm. That deal is just another example. Well, it's, it's the only way that they believe that they can provide a solution. Don't forget, you know, that's what government is. Right. Hey, I'm here to help, um, as opposed to just leaving it alone. And here's, here's the irony. Uh, and I, I introduced the uh, research of uh, Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff. Mm -hmm. And what they show, they have, the, the book covers 800 years, but they've yep. done a lot of studies for National Bureau of Economic Research that cover more recent periods, and they break it down between developed and developing. So you can really target what's going mm -hmm. on, but the results are the same, no matter what subset they study, which is that, 90% um, is a critical threshold. What, if, yep. what physicists debt to GDP. Debt, ninety percent yep. debt to GDP is, oh. is a critical threshold. And a deficit greater than ten percent is a, so double digits, and then triple digits are the two correct bogeys. So, so the Keynesian idea is um, okay. When you're in a liquidity trap, you're in a recession or a depression. Government spending uh, is the only alternative. Increases aggregate demand. There's a multiplier effect. So you you, you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you get a dollar fifty GDP. Mm -hmm. That actually works in very limited circumstances, but it can work, at least for a short period of time. But there's diminishing marginal returns. So you get to a point where you borrow a dollar, spend a dollar, and you get a dollar. What's the point of that? But past 90%, this is what Reinhardt and Rogoff show, you borrow a dollar, you spend a dollar, and you get 90%, or sorry, 90 cents of GDP. Mm -hmm. We actually get less GDP than the amount you borrow. So now what's going on? Back to your uh, uh, fraction. Well, now the debt's going up, but the, the, the growth is less than the increase exactly. in the debt. So the debt to GDP ratio is getting higher and mm -hmm. getting closer to uh, a loss of confidence. As simple yeah, and as it just, it, I mean, I guess every, I mean, Neil Howe, our, our demographer, is very good at reminding me of this. He talks in 25 to 30 year cycles or generational cycles and the politics embedded therein. You just forget that that happened before. Right. I mean, in the 1960s, everybody knew that inflation was the illusion of growth, not, not real growth. Right. And now that's the only option for both parties. It's a bipartisan solution, and it's to what degree are you willing to go there? Right. It's, there, is, there is no other option. Right. And, and so how do, you, how do you break the cycle? So you're in a cycle. And how do you break the dollar for real? Correct. When the Europeans and the British and the Asians and the Latin Americans are all trying to do it at the same time. Well, we know currency how. Of course, this is the problem. The currency wars, in, uh, back to 2010, 2011, you had Krugman and uh, Stiglitz and Rubini, you know, running around with the hair on fire, saying, "You know, the euro is falling apart. Greece has to be kicked out. Spain should quit and devalue the peseta and lower the unit labor costs. There'll be a northern tier and a southern tier." And I said, "No, it's all nonsense. <laughs> Nobody's getting kicked out. Nobody's quitting. They're not breaking it up." And the euro, I said, strong and getting stronger, and it went to a dollar sixty. Uh, at the time, so, you know, obviously. In 2011, yeah, you know, the low the dollar, the higher the euro. Way, way down uh, since then. But, uh, and actually, when I said it, there were 16 members of the Eurozone today, there were 19 members and a couple applications pending. <laughs> I figure, I think Scotland will be the next, uh, next country to join the Euro. Uh, but the, the, the point is, um, you, can't, you can't have a weak dollar and a weak Euro at the same time. It's mathematically impossible to de devalue two currencies against each other at the same time. And so, if you were going to have a weaker dollar, and that was the policy, you're going to have a stronger euro. It's just, it can't yeah. be any other way. It's, exactly. a, it's a mathematical identity. So, so that's where the, that, and that's what I mean. I mean, you truly like for the for PE Powell, I call him, or, or and Trump, and and or Elizabeth Warren or Bernie, whoever it is, they have to start to win that currency war. And you right. have to do a lot more than 25 beeps. You got to do a lot more than 25 than 50 beeps. Right. And Fed balance sheet reduction, et cetera. I really, I mean, I don't think the market's going to. Especially if I'm right that the economic cycle peaked, the triple peak, right. GDP peaked, inflation peaked, profits peaked, all in Q3 of last year. So you're going to slow against that anyway. Right. So again, what are you going to do for me? Is what is what Wall Street's going to say. Yeah. Every meeting I have, I still have to run around doing institutional meetings. Sure. You get to go to cool places like Bretton Woods, but I, you know, every single one has FOMO. Right. They're not talking about, well, what if we're all long FOMO? Like, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and, and, it's, and I, I, if, uh, I always go with, like, God forbid, with if my model's right, like, or if the data, yeah. which drives the model's right. If, if the data continues to slow after the first cut, after the second cut, it's actually very consistent with what happened in 01 right. and what happened throughout 08, right. is that people start to say, wow, this is a problem. Yep. This is a problem. This is a real big problem because the government 
or whatever you know, definition of government spending and or money printing, and now we could have both. Right. It just isn't enough. So that's why I do see that MMT as, a, as, a, as the only real thing that could break the dollar. Yeah, now a lot of people, uh, they read my books and they run into them and say, Jim, I really hope you're wrong. And I say, so do I. Yeah. I don't think I am. <laughs> I wouldn't have written the book, but uh, yeah. I hope I'm wrong because because what's what's out there is uh, is pretty uh, pretty bad. So so you have this debt problem we just we talked about. So w what are the three ways out? Well, one way is growth. Out of what? Out, out of uh, ex excessive debt to GDP and, yeah. and okay. rising rising debt to yep. GDP. The impact of that, the potential loss of confidence, et cetera. How do you get out of it? Out of what I guess uh, Dalia would call the ugly uh, deflation. Right. So one way out is growth, but Reinhardt and Rogoff say you're not getting the growth. The debt is actually headwind to growth. The debt, the debt is hurting your ability to grow your way out of the debt uh, because the debt itself is a headwind to growth. Even, mm -hmm. if, even if everything else was uh, coming up roses, the, the debt slows you down. Okay, that's one way out. Second way out, default. We're not going to default. We, we print the money. <laughs> we print the money, uh, so we're not going to default. The third way out, and the only way out, is inflation. Now, it's a sad day when a central bank wants inflation and can't get it, but we've seen this movie before. We've seen this uh, happen at both times, 1971 with Richard Nixon and 1933 with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You massively devalue the dollar. Yep. Now, they both had gold standards of different kinds, but uh, they devalued the dollar against gold. Uh, well, we basically raised the price of gold. Mm -hmm. uh, FDR took it from $20 an ounce to $35. Nixon took it from $35 an ounce to jump ball, but it ended up at $800 by January 1980. But, it, but so that, these were like 80, 90 percent devaluations of the dollar. You could do it against gold. The problem today is we don't have a gold standard. Yeah. I tell people you can get a personal gold standard, just go buy some gold. And you know, all the gold bugs are like, we need a gold standard. I was like, be careful what you wish for. If, you're, if you want to make money in gold, gold standard is the last thing you want because that's a fixed price. And it's the last thing that people are long. What is the total global asset or U.S. asset allocation and global asset allocation institutionally like or 2%, otherwise? Two percent. Two percent. I mean, well, institutional money manager asset allocation is less than a half a percent. Okay. You so, know what I mean? Yeah. But that, yeah, global asset allocation. So, so Maybe that's, I mean, well, maybe the, the, that's the point. I mean, if they were actually long it like the Russians or whoever else, right. you know, buying it in, 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 as much as they can. Well, I had the, I had the occasion to <laughs> ask Larry Summers at dinner a couple of days ago, uh, and I, I had my own, I, I knew the answer, but I wanted to hear <laughs> what his, the question. I wanted, I wanted to hear what his answer was. He's a big brain. Yeah. And uh, I said, uh, okay, so in the last 10 years, Russia has more than tripled its gold reserves. And China has more than tripled its gold reserves. Probably more because it tripled. It tripled. Yeah. In the last ten years, Russia's gone from 600 tons to 2,300 tons. China's gone from 600 tons to about 2,000 tons. But but they have a lot more off the books. But let's I'll, I'll take the official number. And I said, why are they doing it? I didn't turn the question into a you know discussion. I didn't give a speech. I said, why are they doing it? And he sort of thought about it for a second, and he said, well, diversification. <laughs> And I thought, well, that's actually technically a good. It's yeah, technically it a good answer. It's part of the answer. It's not a bad answer, but that means that you don't like the dollar so much. Uh, and then he said, uh, "This is a quote." He said, "Maybe they think the price will go up." Yeah. I said, "Well, I got Larry Summers on the record saying the you know, higher gold prices. I'm on board with that." Uh, but you know, he's thoughtful, and and those were uh, the real reason is that they're preparing for a non-dollar-based system, uh, and they're doing this in conjunction with development of yeah. a permissioned blockchain. And a cryptocurrency that maybe the Russians are the no. Rus yeah. the Russians and the Chinese that mm -hmm. maybe call it the Putin coin or the G coin or whatever, and with a um, with a permission this is a permissioned blockchain which is like joining a club you you only get in if the membership committee says you're in otherwise you're out on the street so permission blockchain by the way solves a host of scalability and sustainability problems that open blockchain uh, currencies have but uh, so it's a club so who's in the club well Russia China Iran. Turkey, oh, God. North Korea, Venezuela, and but maybe they'll extend some invitations to the BRICS, so maybe Brazil has interest, and China can prevail in Hong Kong, so you have a money center, and now Iran sells oil to China, China sells infrastructure to Russia, Russia sells natural gas to Turkey, North Korea sells weapons to Iran, all this is going on, and what's missing from that trading network? The dollar. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no dollar in it. Mm -hmm. And then, Here's where the gold comes in. So now your cryptocurrency, what, what's that? Well, but you, you just use it as a way to keep score. I mean, you can use baseball cards to keep score, but you use it as a way to keep score, and you have to have a system surplus. It's like any trading network. And then periodically, once a year or twice a year, you settle up, mm -hmm. but you settle up in gold. 
And the, the importance of that is uh, you need a lot less gold if you're settling on a net basis instead of a gross basis. If every yep. time I buy weapons, I gotta give you gross gold. Okay, but, but if like, I'm buying something from you and you're buying something from me, the net's a lot smaller. You need a lot less gold. Yep. Completely feasible, heading in that direction. I t I t this is what we told the Pentagon 10 years ago when we did the financial war game. And it also solves, I mean, uh, over the, you know, Bitcoin, I don't want to get into crypto or Bitcoin, but I mean, one of the biggest problems that the bears have is that there's nothing behind it. There's no government behind it. Right. But if you backstop a government crypto, with gold. Right, that's what we're talking about. Now we're talking about crypto that I really like, yeah, especially this, like if I have my gold. Yeah. This is not Bitcoin. This, yeah. is, no, this is a new currency, permission distributed ledger, backed by gold, settled on a net basis so you don't need as much gold. Yep. Uh, and you can always buy more. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I told the Treasury, you know, I, I talked to you know, the government officials all the time, and I said, uh, and like, well, what do we do about the, do about this. I said, well, you ought to buy gold. It's, it's just an open market operation. Uh, what does the Fed do now? They buy treasury notes. You know, so I buy treasury notes from yep. your, your Goldman Sachs. I you know, put the money in your account. You got you probably deposit it back with me, but that's up to you. Um, so just buy some gold and print the money. Mm -hmm. you, you, we get two things. You get inflation, and you would front run the Russians and the Chinese. And then I recommended the intelligence services take a closer look at refineries. That's where the, all the refineries in Switzerland, that's where the gold goes. They get all this Junks, you know, from the Fed, Federal Reserve Bank in New York, mm -hmm. you know, these gnarly old 1920 bars. They melt them down, put them into one kilo bars, and ship them off to China. Get in the middle of that, so you need better intelligence. The uh, U.S. Fed should conduct open market operations in gold. Uh, the price will go up, yeah, that makes it harder for your enemies to get more of what they're trying to use to defeat you. But this is a little out of the box. No, but you know what? It's, it's out of the box at the next part of the movie. <laughs> or in the next, yeah. in the next move. This is like right. maybe we should you could start a, a brand like Marvel, where there's endless comics of content, yeah. and you have to just keep going down the line. It, to get to that part of the line, the U.S. or whoever the administration is at that point is going to have to react to what you're essentially saying is already in motion at the other part of the line. Right. It's not. I don't know if you'd agree with this. Isn't it a little bit like the U.S. taking over as the world's reserve currency from the British and the Europeans? at a different point in time, mm -hmm. where basically it's like, oh, I'll just let you guys all be as dysfunctional as you can be while George Soros like, publicly shorts you, and yeah. we use the power of our own bank balance sheet, call Citigroup, call, you know, what would Soros do? I mean, it's like, a, it was a coordinated effort. Co right. you know, Kozner, every one of these guys, oh yeah, we're gonna short the pound, we, we know that they have to devalue. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's basically balance of power, which historically has always followed yeah. the base of GDP well, and the growth of GDP, right. which the Chinese, think they'll have by 2025. They think they'll be number one in the world yeah, by on the way, GDP. The Soros story is true, although what's less known is that Soros got a back channel heads up from the Deutsche Bundesbank at the time said, we don't have their back. So he, he went into it with a lot of air cover, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but he went with but, it. But it worked I'm exactly thinking the about way the you local described. Side. You can short a whole country yeah. if you have enough uh, We go power. with it with our guys. Yeah. And quite clearly, the group of guys that you stated, if it's Russian, Chinese, and Iranian, is not our guys. Right. Yeah, right. By the way, Iran had uh, got a, uh, not clear, but maybe as much as uh, 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 100 tons of gold from the United States. When Obama did that payoff, when they dropped the stuff on the pallets, he had, he had to uh, give them like $150 billion. He had to go to the, uh, <laughs> no, had to go to the Netherlands <laughs> to get euros because the Iranians said, we don't want dollars. So Obama was like, all right, here's dollars, give us the euros. So they, they were just, you know, they wrapped them up in big, you know, million dollar, million euro bundles, put them on a pallet. You know, just shoved them off a cargo plane with a bunch of gold. No one knows exactly how much, but Iran could have as much as 100 tons, which is a lot of gold. They're hanging on to it. Really? So, yeah, Iran is a gold power, uh, but they haven't disclosed it. But they're in this network. And Turkey uh, is, uh, is, is a major gold buyer right now. Uh, Russia's reserves, the, the total reserve account that was back on, uh, on its way to 500 billion, is 20% gold, not 2% or 5%. So gold. as a percentage of GDP, that's high. Oh yeah, no, Russia's, of Russian GDP. well that's another, good, good point Keith, that's another metric I, I use, gold to GDP. And the theory is, by country? Gold is by country. Is that in your new book too? Uh, it's in uh, the, the prior book, uh, The Road to Ruin. Okay. Uh, but, uh, so if gold is real money, I think it is, so gold Maybe is real that's money, where I remembered it. and GDP is your real economy. Yep. So gold to GDP kind of says, all right, how much money do you have relative to the size of the economy? Uh, the US and China are about, 1.6 or 7%, Russia's over 
So they, they are, they have very little external debt, highest gold to GDP ratio of any uh, major economy. Um, and they've got 20% of the reserves in gold. Uh, and the other thing about gold, physical, I, I sound like gold sale. I'm not, people accuse me, of, oh, you're just trying to sell gold. I'm like, no, I'm not a dealer, I don't sell gold. You can buy it or not, it's up to you. But I am an analyst, I do look at it, and I do think of it in a geopolitical And context. you did author a book called The New Bull Case for Gold. I had to write and, that book because I was so fed up with, <laughs> uh, I don't mind criticism and debate, I'm all for it. But the criticisms were all wrong. I mean, they were just empirically, yeah. historically uh, wrong. So I had to write a book just to kind of you know, push all that to one side. I, even at Bretton Woods a couple of days ago. What's well, a framework? I mean, it's yeah. a, it's and it's important that we have multiple frameworks if we're going to have a, a, a multi-factor, multi-duration debate. Right. You know. So yeah, the, God bless you for putting a framework out there. It's supposed to just spewing one-liners. Yeah. The amount of people on Twitter that tell me that I'm going to get train wreck long gold because. Inflation's coming back. I'm just like, I'm actually what? long gold for real yields falling, you idiot. I mean, yeah. it's 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 like people's preconceptions about gold. It's it's good on you for doing that. That's yeah. also one of my favorite books. Right. And it doesn't mean you have to be long X amount of gold all the time. It helps you understand gold. Right. Which is what you've you taught yourself. So you can you can introduce it into a monetary debate if you so choose. If you and want I'm it. Very yeah. enthusiastic about that. Uh, uh, Judy Shelton going on the Federal Reserve Board. You like her? Oh yeah, I do. She's she's, a, she's going for like if she must have my economic outlook because she wants <laughs> 50 basis point cut. She's a smart lady. She reads a lot and she. Yeah. Uh, uh, everyone's like, oh, she gets on the board. She with, likes you. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, she, you know, we kind of have a you know a Twitter back and forth, and uh, she's actually featured in Chapter Six of my new book. Oh, uh, she is. Aftermath. Aftermath. Yeah. That that chapter is called the Mar-a-Lago Accord, and basically I posit a new Bretton Woods. And the point I make is Mar-a-Lago that, <laughs> well, what better? Actually, the Mar-a-Lago in its own, you know, Marjorie Merriweather Post Love built this National Historic Landmark, but it bears a resemblance to the palace in Genoa where they had the 1922 International Monetary Conference. So like kind of old school. But, uh, but the point is, uh, I spoke to Ben Bernanke personally and John Lipsky, I don't know if you know John, but John was the, the head of the IMF yep. for a period of time. Uh, the first American ever to run it because DSK got arrested and they weren't ready with Christine Lagarde, so he had to step in. But they, DSK. <laughs> but they um, separately, in two conversations, one on one, 9,000 miles apart, they both said the international monetary system is incoherent. And I know they didn't rehearse that for my benefit. That's, it just told me that that word is in the air among the, the super elites. Uh, and it is because there's no anchor. Now, it doesn't mean you go back to a gold standard tomorrow, but you have to confront the problem. We, this is what we're talking about with the dollar and the euro. It's two kids on a seesaw. Yeah. They can't both devalue. The only way two currencies can devalue at the same time is if they devalue against a third anchor. Like, the, you can take exactly. the euro and the dollar down. This is why this is a, I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to be right on any specific duration. That would be completely arrogant to time it. Uh, but there is, there is a map to get there, right? And you know, the, the, all of global macro trades, particularly quantitative strategies, trade, and all of my processes operate off the U.S. dollar index price, right? You know, so the U.S. dollar index is basically the euro. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, you, you just have to knock that balance of power over to another power, right? And then that power, if it's credible, I mean, you know, Chinese China's going to if if if, if they lie for long enough. They'll have, to, they'll have the number one GDP in the world by 2025. Mm -hmm. Whatever they decide to denominate in or, or have their currencies and, and, and credit backstopped in, currently they have to buy it funded in dollars. Right. They have a current account deficit that's developing after having a current account surplus for as far as the eye can see, which was great mm -hmm. when you're running 10, 12% made up growth. Yep. Now you're running half of that still made up. You're running a current account deficit and you're funding your debts in dollars. Right. So they would love nothing more than not to have to do that. Yep. They can't, they can't even go dovish right now because the dollar's strong. Right. The PBOC guy goes, yeah, I see the Fed going dovish, but yeah, we can't do it. Right. Yeah, they can't. They could in 2016 when the dollar was going down. Yep. And uh, the, uh, the problem with China is a good example of what's called Goodhart's Law. And Goodhart's Law says that whenever a metric becomes the object of policy, it loses meaning as a metric. In other words, if it's just out there, you, like can, you can study yep. it, put it, put it in a factor analysis or whatever. But the minute you target the metric, it's no longer valid as a metric. It becomes just an expression of policy. Mm -hmm. And Chinese GDP is there. Chinese GDP means nothing because, first of all, it's, uh, I'm not saying they totally lie. I'm saying they make it whatever they want to by policy. Mm -hmm. So when it's coming in a little bit low, just 
build some more ghost cities. That's <laughs> GDP. It's a complete waste. Yeah. If you, know, if you had a general accepted accounting principles, you'd write it off the same as soon as the building was done. But um, but it is technically GDP because there's steel, concrete, glass, construction, etc. in it, and so driven by credit, funded by wealth management products that people think are bank deposits, yep. but they're not really. So it's a massive Ponzi. Uh, not to mention the fact that the investment component, there are about 45 percent of GDP is investment. Mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S., it's more like 22 percent, which is normal for a developed economy. But 45 um, percent of GDP is investment, of which half is wasted. So if you take that percentage, you know, if you haircut yep. it by that amount, you would qu get quickly to a number like four or five percent, and a lot of analysts think it's even lower. They think yep. China's GDP, maybe it's three percent or maybe less. So, uh, but on this massive credit bubble, so that's that has its own instabilities. Yeah, but, but it also has its own incentives in their long term. I mean, G's in it to win it. The guy used to live in a cave. He wants to come out and stay out of right. that cave or not get that's killed. Right. Uh, okay, we have some, and uh, we, we're hashtagging it, I believe. Uh, what are we saying, guys? Ask Jim. Ask Jim Rickards. So I got a ton of questions, and I started asking him late, Jim, uh, just because I could talk to you for the rest of sure. the day. Uh, <laughs> but um, we're getting tons of questions on gold, and I think people like say, okay, you know, look, tell me how and how many different ways you you would buy it, and is this is this in aftermath? Actually, do you go through? Uh, it's in. Know, it's in aftermath. Because some people are like, should, they're scared of the ETF. Should they own the physical? Should they own both? I mean, there's a lot of questions about that. Right. Um, so first of all, if you're like you're, you're a day trader, securities driven, the ETF is a, is a good proxy. I, w I don't view it as a store of value. Right. I don't view it as uh, protection against the kinds of things we're talking about in the book. But if you know you just need to trade it day in day out, that, that's fine at least for the, the time being. I recommend physical bullion. Now the mm -hmm. the new standard, gold standard, no pun intended, is the one kilo bar. Uh, so it used to be the 400 ounce bar. That's the that's still the LBMA good delivery bar. A little heavy. By the way, well that's well that's that was intentional. That was done around World War One. That's mm -hmm. when they created it, and they did it on purpose. They wanted something that was so heavy you couldn't carry it around. <laughs> so it's like yeah, we're still on the gold standard sort of, but you know all the gold's in the vaults and we control them. So uh, no one was walking. And prior to World War One, if you were you know, a Brit and you went from London to uh, Bombay at the time, now Mumbai. You had a purse of gold coins. You know, you might put it in the ship's safe. Uh, they were, you know, British sovereigns, and they they weren't one ounce. They were like a quarter ounce. You know, so it was spendable. Um, and that's how you. And that's yep. what you did. after World War One, forget it. Nobody walked around with gold coins because there weren't any gold coins. There were 400 ounce bars that are. I've lifted quite a few. They're they're, they're 35 pounds. I can yep. see. I, I smile for the camera, but it's like, oh, my arm hurts. <laughs> but it's like you know, it's a heavy free weight. But. Uh, uh, but the new standard established by the Chinese is a 4.9, so 99.99% pure, one kilo bar. Okay. So that's a that's a, they're about uh, fifty thousand dollars a piece at, at, at the market. So um, so you buy those, um, and if you're an individual, I, I like the one ounce American Gold Eagles, uh, and uh, very high quality. Counterfeiting problems go away. Uh, but uh, that's that's the way to own it, and you know, I run into you know living, <laughs> having lived in this uh, neighborhood we're out, we're out here in Fairfield County uh, uh, for 35 years. You know you run into your share of billionaires, and I've never met one <laughs> who uh, like they can trade stocks and bonds all day, but they all have gold, and they oh, don't yeah. say it publicly, but they all got gold. It's all in a vault, and then I run into the ones say, Where, I say, where's your gold? And they go, well, it's in Singapore, you know, and a good jurisdiction, tax free, and all that. So, well, how are you going to get there? I got a private jet over at Westchester. It's like, <laughs> well, how are you going to fuel it when the power goes down? You know, it's like, why is the pilot going to fly you and leave his family? You know, it's like people yeah. think they've got these plans all worked out, but they, yeah. they don't really think it through. Yeah, they they, they do own it, um, Jim. But if China Russia create this internetwork coin, don't they need you? This is a good question. Don't they need dollars to buy gold? At least the deficit trader inside their network that need to balance. Uh, with with the other. Well, it's why a it's a very good question. It's why they're buying as much gold as they can right now. Yep. It's why China does not. It's why the it. Russians and Chinese are. Russians are Chinese buying gold yeah. hand over fist. The country that should be buying gold that isn't is the United States. Yes. But Russian China is buying as fast as but they can. But who was the country that bought a shitload of gold back before when the British had the world's reserve currency? Uh, yeah. The U.S. Right. I mean, yeah. we, we, well, in 1950, uh, the United States had 20,000 tons of gold. Yes. By 1970, we were down to 9,000 tons. Today, it's a little bit over eight. Where did the 11,000 tons go? Well, it went to France, Germany, yeah. Italy, uh, Netherlands, our trading partners, Japan, etc. Because in those days, you could hand in your dollars and get gold. 
So China comes along 30 years later, 40 years later, they're the dominant mercantilist power, they're the, they've got the huge trade surpluses, and they're looking around like, where's the gold? We don't mm -hmm. get gold anymore, we just get treasury notes. So yep. all these other guys got gold, we get paper. Um, and so they just set out uh, on their own gold standard, and they're pursuing as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. Now here's, um, I mean, actually, and I gotta, I gotta give it to a lot of people, but um, for putting in these questions. But a lot of people just have a thing that they state, particularly if you enter what you do, uh, enter political names and political periods. Like people have a view that is often politicized on what actually happened. Right. It's just a view. It's yeah. not a multi-factor, uh, multi-duration mathematical view. Often, it's just an assumed view. So you've agitated those people. Well done. Um, this one is kind of. Uh, in between, I actually think that this this one isn't isn't completely politicized. Uh, decline of debt to GDP from Truman to Reagan was not due to the down payment of debt, due to growth and in inflation. Was not inflation the primary vehicle? Uh, well, it is true. No, they, we didn't pay it on the debt at all. The debt no. went up, but what we did is we grew the economy. Yes, and that was real growth. Yep. Uh, the numbers I'm talking about. That's are, what we said. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, the same thing with Clinton. Yeah. The uh, the the um, the numerator grew. Uh, the, the debt is. Uh, rarely gone, talking about nominal value, the debt has rarely gone down. Mm -hmm. Andrew Jackson, uh, 1836, paid off the national debt. We had, Andrew Jackson's legacy was zero national debt and no central bank. He, got, he destroyed the second bank of the United States and paid off the national debt. So thank you. We had 80 years of great, yes. great prosperity yeah. with no central bank and, and starting out with a low debt level. So no, you don't, it's not, no, it's not because you paid down the debt, it's because you Because you have real growth. Yeah, real and, growth. And Correct. I can't say this enough times to people. I mean, because I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm right. a Canadian, and if, even if I was American, I wouldn't be either. It's just like an embarrassment to be about these political parties because yeah, they do the I same agree. thing yeah. uh, in my world. I mean, it's bipartisan. Um, but, you know, 1993 to 1999 or 1983 to 89, if Reagan's your guy or if yeah. you're a Dem, pick it. The, uh, the average real GDP growth rate was around 4.5%, and the average price of oil was sub-20. Right. The dollar was strong in both periods. Yep. Strong dollar, strong America, period. Right. Strong dollar in any country per perpetuates the purchasing power of the people. Correct. So, you know, our policies have to go, I mean, they don't have to, but there's no, you know, I'm not going to, nobody wants me to run for, a Canadian to run for the President of the United States. At some point, they'll want to run. But, but, <laughs> I mean, but you don't, it's, it's, it's inconsistent with history. And it's also, if you look at any period where debt as a percentage of GDP went down, right. it's a function of those periods that I just mentioned. That's right. So it's, um, you know, it's, 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 it's an interesting thing. I, 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 is there a hope in hell that anybody runs on that political platform? No. You can't, because Trump is running for the Republicans, which is basically like a, a Democrat running on MMT. Right. And you have the Democrats, like you said, running on MMT. Well, right. So you got to wait for the next one. They're not running on it, and and the reason is that there's a lot of pain involved. But my view is the pain is unavoidable. If you want real growth in the future and a sustainable uh, debt level, and a it doesn't have to be a strong dollar. It just has to be a solid dollar. Stable, non-volatile. Sta stable dollar is is a, is a good. Actually, way to if, you, put it. if you say it that in, in volatility speak, which is by the way, what is the least volatile asset class you could own right now? Gold. Right. You know, the vol on gold is is like falling towards seven. Mm -hmm. Oil vols even at 33, and they're and they're trying to cut rates. Um, but I mean, the lack of volatility is also something that creates the confidence. There's right. another way to think about that. Right, and uh, yeah, cash does the same thing. So uh, maybe I, that's why the Russians, Chinese want the low vol to back it. And it's kind of what Larry Summer said. You know, it's like, uh, uh, yeah, if, if your treasury notes are bouncing around, your euros or uh, your buns are bouncing around, et cetera, and, uh, you know, heaven help you if you have stocks in, in a reserve position, it's okay for a portfolio. Uh, yeah, gold's a stabilizer. Uh, hmm. and, and, but that's why I use ratios, because uh, I, you know, yep. I, I don't have to get into the, the, the numbers. You know, the debt all, pretty much always goes up. The question is, are you growing faster? That's the key. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here. Uh, let's see, what else do we got? I just fell off here. Um, if Jim is correct, how can Japan do it with 2% debt to G GDP and actually just keep on going? Right. Well, the, the, answer, the answer in Japan is, there, there are two answers. Number one, uh, they owe most of the debt to themselves. They don't have a large it's external all internal. debt. So I compare it to a bunch of people in the lifeboat, you know, in the middle of the ocean sharing the food. Like, so far, so good, but, you know, <laughs> keep going. And I, I had an interesting conversation with uh, uh, Saki Kibara, uh, who, who was known as Mr. Yen. He was, uh, I think, deputy... Minister of Finance. That's a great nickname. Yeah, yes, yeah, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Yen. Um, and uh, but but there was a recent conversation. He was he was a 
household name in, in these circles in the uh, 80s and early 90s, but I, I met him a couple years ago. And I said, uh, I kind of asked the same question. I said, you know, it, the lost decade is now three lost decades. Um, you're, you know, you have periodic recessions, low growth, disinflation, you're not growing. And, and he, I said, you're never going to get to 2% inflation. He said, we're absolutely not going to get to 2%. 2% inflation, so he agreed with that. I said, like, what are you gonna do? But I, it was true that when I go to the Ginza, like the lights are on, the restaurants are open, yep. everyone's having a good, and he made a profound point. He said, our population is declining, so our per capita GDP figures are outperforming our total GDP figures. And I see the math, I said, yeah, that's right, interesting. Uh, so I said, so, the, so the, the end game is, you have the third largest economy in the world with one citizen who's like the richest person in the world, even though it's gone down. And But his point was um, that on a per capita basis, they're doing a lot better. Yeah, and I hear this a lot. I'm sure yeah. you do too. I mean, social harmony. Yeah. But again, that's I, Canadian came to an American in the 1990s, me, because of free market capitalism. Right. To be clear, bipartisan policy on MMT, if it is to be Japanese, is not free market capital. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, I, again, uh, Trump Trump likes low rates, leverage, uh, you know, minimal equity, uh, declare bankruptcy when you have to and move on. So I don't uh, I don't exclude the possibility that he could. And by the way, MMT is not that different from neo-keynesianism. Now, the neo-keynesians will say, well, you can't go unlimited and by the way, you got to set priorities and the priorities are always political. And the MMTers are like, well, there really is no limit, and we can spend money on everything. All right, that's a difference. But the basic idea that you can just fund everything with debt, there's no constraint, yeah. and you know, name your own priority, uh, is the same. Yeah. Here's a, here's a good one. Only uh, maybe this is one of the last questions. <laughs> uh, I knew somebody was going to mention this, and I, I don't know if you have thoughts, but you know, Jim, what's up with Cudlow? Wasn't he the strong dollar guy? Uh, look, Larry Cudlow is a really nice guy uh, personally, yeah. and a very, very uh, decent uh, and smart individual. Yeah. Uh, his forecasting record is not great, uh, and I th think, you know, not, uh, I wouldn't disparage him, but he ought to have some pom-poms when he comes out, because he is a, <laughs> he is a cheerleader. Now, maybe that's his job. If you're the head it of is. the National it Economic is. Council, that's probably yeah. your job. Um, but, you know, today's... Uh, uh, GDP figure, it, it just reminded me of Wall Street where, um, you know, you lower the expectations on earnings and then you beat them and everyone on CNBC is like, oh, it's a beat, you know, it's like, yeah, but what's, look at the actual numbers, is it higher or lower, what's the trend here? Uh, but, you know, you, you, you rig the expectations, you beat it, whatever, and your stock goes up a penny. Yeah, the pom-pom uh, beats yeah, so, uh, so, okay, so the 2.1 percent beat the 1.8 or 1.3 expectations, yep. I understand that. 2.1% is lower than the 10-year average growth since the end of the last recession. You go June 2009 yeah, to June uh, uh, 2019, or now in July. Um, the average is about 2.2, a little slightly higher, mm -hmm. about 2.2. This quarter came in at 2.1. Mm -hmm. You're below the 10-year average. Yeah. So I wouldn't get too excited. And most importantly, you're well below where we were when you, hashtag U.S. growth was accelerating. Correct. I mean, that, this was, you know, if you're, if you're data-driven, you saw that last year. I mean, right. guys, show slide uh, 14, I think it is, in the global macro deck, where you can see. You know, we banged a 4, stayed at you know, 3.4. Yeah. Now we're 2 and falling. and taking out the, the, the Q4 restatement was a disaster, by the right. way. So Larry should just call those, like they're, they're right up there on the screen. They are what they are. Everybody should know them. There shouldn't be any political obfuscation over these numbers. I think, I think the bigger question when it comes to Kudlow has to do with the conservatism. Because right. what I'm basically saying is, and by the way, the 2.1 beat the 1.8 that we were at because of government spending was third, the, 30, the, the delta. So right. Larry Kudlow is not a big government, or wasn't a big government spending guy, and he certainly wasn't a dollar devaluation guy. Yeah, by the way, that government spending component is going to go up, as, right. you know, looking down the road. Uh, and it's all about 2020 election and yeah. electoral politics and all that. But uh, my first reaction was uh, it's lower than the 10-year average, and that's, that, that's not a healthy Yeah, and, and the most important thing, like I always, and this is the only thing I really care about, it's the secret to the universe, of course, is calculus, which yeah. is the rate of change. Right. The rate of change just slowed again. Yeah. And this on a sine curve slows again and again. That's what the that's what economies do. Exactly. And the and the promise is that a central banker can I think that's our cartoon of the day yeah. can can part the heavens and, and manage the seas yeah. and eliminate economic gravity. Right. And this is uh, that's exactly right, Keith. And this is what I heard from the Fed officials of Britain was that rates are coming down. This wasn't like uh, oh, whisper it in the hall. This is like no. This is, this has to happen. Real rates have to come down. Nominal rates have to come down. 
Um, zero bound may not be a bound. I mean, they were just yeah. saying this. So, how can guys like Jeff? Maybe the last question for me, um, just because I get to ask it. Uh, the uh, like, how do guys like Jeff Gunlack and all the people that were telling us that the ten-year yield was going to go to four only ten months ago? Yep, we're at two. Right. Uh, how do they fight? Like, how do you fight the Fed on that? They always tell me not to fight the Fed. How are they gonna? Like, how do they do that? Look, after my career at, uh, at Citibank, yeah, I retired from Citibank, and then I joined, went to Wall Street, went to the dark side, and I was at, <laughs> I was at one of the major government bond dealers for ten years, and that's when I got my immersion in, uh, you know, fiscal policy and finance and derivatives and all that, all that kind of stuff. And uh, some of those guys are still around, still trading. That's fine, good for them. They, one by one, they're getting carried out feet first. And the reason is that when we started this firm, is back in the early 80s, you know, interest rates were 13%. Yeah. You could buy a 30-year bond maturing in 2016 uh, at, uh, at 15%. It was a good, good buy. But the point is, so nominal rates came down from 13 14% to 2%. So they just kind of intuitively said, uh, we, we can't believe it. it was, it's, we've never seen it so low. It can't go any lower. Uh, it's got to go up. So they shorted, they shorted the bonds. Um, sorry, uh, nominal rates came down. Real rates didn't, yeah. uh, number one. Number two, look at Germany. Uh, and why, is, why could Germany be negative uh, you know, 40, 50 basis points for the bonds? Well, there are only uh, a couple explanations for that. One is you think the euro is going to get a lot stronger. Because if you're a US dollar-based investor, and you want to go long euros for five years? You can't do it. You can't do it in the futures market. You can mm -hmm. do it. You can roll a position, but the one way to lock in a euro position for five or ten years is to buy bonds. So now, yeah, negative rate. Yeah, but that's sort, that's sort of like a, that's like uh, paying an option premium for a five-year yep. five-year call on the euro. Mm -hmm. uh, so one, it would be if the euro got a lot stronger, that would work. Um, and uh, the other one is that uh, U.S. rates are going to come down a lot more. Mm -hmm. So uh, and maybe even go negative. Yeah. So that's that's where we're heading. That's yeah, a big euro dollar uh, position that people have on. People say, ah, Keith, good call. It's a consensus. So now it's like, well, consensus can remain. Yeah. Particularly if both parties in the U.S. agree. Right. And that's um, thanks for illuminating that. And, and and most importantly, I think you're the only per you are the only person. And by the way, you're the author of it, so <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. But you're the only person I've spoken to in months that's tied this this developing uh, interest in MMT, which is to your point, not new to what the other team is going to do, mm -hmm. which is exactly what Currency War is. The a, it's, it's the A against the blue team. Didn't yep. you call it that way? And I think that that's like whenever, and I go back to the quote that we started with, you know, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. Right. So, um, so thanks for that. If, if you haven't uh, read Currency Wars or any of Jim's books, uh, you absolutely have to do that. It'll help you be a student of the game uh, to start, and then you could try to uh, help get better at the game, which we all do uh, as we go further in time. Aftermath is, is the most recent book, and. Uh, Thanks for your time. You can follow both Jim and I on Twitter.